Great. Okay, thank you for uh, allowing me to give a talk. So I'm Sebastian Huppert. I'm a NASA Hubble Fellow at the University of Arizona. And as Simona said, I'm going to talk about data-driven uh, predictive control, uh, which is based on a paper that we have recently submitted. Uh, um, so here below, you can see all the collaborators. Um, one of the challenges, as uh, yesterday was also uh, discussed, is the uh, temporal control error in an AO system. So it's not really a, a super uh, strong uh, noise source for normal imaging, where you see the normal PSF. And I mean, you can see here the difference between two situations, one with a very long atmospheric coherence time and one with a short coherence time. And you see here on the left that the PSF itself is not really severely impacted by the uh, coherence time. Well, if you look at the post-coronagraphic PSF, we can actually see that there's a uh, substantial difference between the two. I mean, at short coherence time, you can see the wind-driven halo coming up and adding additional noise in the dark zone where we want to search for uh, planets. So we really need to correct the, the wavefront errors before they appear. Um, so I would like to do that in a, with data-driven predictive control. Um, and the one thing that I want to use is a linear model because those are easy to analyze. Um, but uh, because of that, we need to work in closed loop or at least the model needs to be analyzed in closed loop because we may have nonlinear behavior in the open loop. I mean, uh, everybody would like pyramid wavefront sensors, but pyramid wavefront sensors have nonlinearities. So we, should, we need to be able to work with the closed loop residuals. Um, we want to have a, an adaptive control lab because we need to be robust against changes in the atmosphere. And I prefer a model free approach because we do not know exactly how well we can actually calibrate the system and how well we know the actual disturbances that come in. Um, so the method that I'm using is the data-driven subspace predictive control. It's like a complete mouthful. But what it means is that you're using a time series of the measurements and a time series of some commands that you have. And one of the things that I use is that I use the wavefront error measurements. So not the complete open loop reconstructed wavefront, wavefronts, but I use the wavefront error measurements of every time step. And I use the delta commands of every time step. And one of the uh, benefits is that the, this integrator, because it's only using the deltas, will become a predictive integrator instead of a predictive proportional control. And that helps with beating down on model errors because it's an integrator. So what you then do is you choose how much of the past data you want to connect to your future data. For example, here I select the N past data samples and the M uh, future samples and create two vectors, which are the past and the future vector. And then the only thing that you need to do is you need you add a matrix in between all your uh, data. So as you can see here, we connect the past measurements, the past commands, and the future commands to your future errors. So this is our model that we use to predict uh, the whole state. Um, the reason why you need those three things is because the past errors are important, because they drive what the system is going to do, and also because they contain the evolution of the atmosphere. Your past commands are important because the control is not instantaneous and your DM can have a complicated temporal response. So those that need to be included in the evolution of your future error measurements. And also the future commands themselves are important because depending on your horizon of your uh, future, uh, what you want to predict, it could be that uh, several future commands will impact your error measurements. So it's important to have all the three um, uh, components in your prediction. So this is the prediction matrix. And from this, you can derive the controller. So I'm not going through that uh, because it's just math and it's a bit, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of time, but you can uh, in principle read it in uh, several of the uh, uh, literature that I put down here. Um, so this algorithm in principle, we could control, uh, we could create the complete spatial temporal uh, interaction matrix. So you can just go for your modal coefficients to your slopes and let it learn um, that full interaction matrix. But that's quite computational expensive, especially if you do it for XAO systems that have more than a thousand modes. 
then you're talking about learning matrices that are on the size of 10,000 by 10,000. And then you also have correlation matrices. So it's really difficult to, uh, so it's really computational expensive. So what I chose to do was to do a distributive control where you apply this uh, temporal controller to every uh, spatial mode that you reconstruct. So the, uh, as, uh, the flow itself is just you have your data from your wavefront sensor, you apply a, a model reconstructor. So in my case, I use matrix factor multiplications and then you apply the temporal controller to every mode independently and then send it to the VM and then you can start again. Uh, and that really helps uh, to uh, beat down on the computational burden. So the uh, system that I uh, simulated is uh, the is similar to Maggie OX. So we have a six and a half meter telescope, which is similar to the Magellan Clay telescope, 50 actuators across the pupil. Uh, my simulations are run them at a kilohertz with two frames of delay. And the wavefront sensor that I use for all the measurements is direct phase sensor. So I just take the direct waveform from the uh, simulations because I wanted to take out the effects of the um, um, of the uh, waveform sensor in these uh, simulations. So here you can see one of the first uh, simulations I did. So important to notice that in the beginning the algorithm doesn't know anything about the system. So in the beginning you need to do some training or system identification, depends a bit on which uh, area you work in, what you call it. Um, but I start this, these first five seconds by injecting random binary noise on the actuators. So you get random perturbations and that helps uh, the system to explore uh, what it should do. And as you can see, in green, we have the predictor. In orange, we have a, a integrator just as a reference. And in blue, we have a disturb, uh, the uh, disturbance. What, can, what you can see here is that within the first second, of the, in, the uh, uh, predictive controller has already learned how uh, it should behave. So one th thing that I forgot to note is that because this is a linear model, you can use least squares methods to, up, uh, to update itself. And because uh, we want to be able to adapt to the atmosphere, uh, I use an online method. So at every time step, I update all the prediction matrices, all the control matrices. So that's all happening online at every time step. So here you really see uh, in the beginning, you really see uh, the system learning. And then after five seconds, I switch off the uh, random binary noise. And then we see the actual performance. So the last th uh, 25 seconds is uh, without the injected noise. And we see that it keeps improving. If you zoom in on the on how it improves, we can uh, measure that it still improves as one over square root t over this whole uh, 25 seconds. So that's uh, 25,000 frames, and it keeps learning, which means that the uh, samples are uh, probably uh, are uncorrelated enough to really uh, get this one over square root t uh, limit. So even after 30, 000, 30 seconds, I have not seen the asymptotic behavior. And this was a really long simulation, so I have no clue how long it, <laughs> how long it, when it will reach its limits. Um, yeah. So if you instead of looking at the temporal behavior, you look at the spatial behavior. So you look at the post-coronagraphic uh, uh, dark holes. We can uh, do that. So on the left, you can see what I call perfect control or instantaneous control, where you uh, remove the uh, other modes that the DM can control at, uh, instantaneously. In the middle, you have the integrator again as reference, and then on the right is the brief controller. As you can see, there are still some residuals that are a couple times 10 to the minus six in the dark hole, and that's due to some spatial fitting errors in my DM, in my DM code. So I have probably not applied enough regularization. But as you can see in the predictive controller, most of the speckles within the dark hole are the same as the uh, instantaneous control speckles, only at the inner working angle do we see an increase, which is a bit more clear in the actual um, contrast curve. So here you can see that with the predictive controller, we are very close to this perfect uh, control. We are within a factor two of the perfect instantaneous control. So that's quite, uh, it's quite nice. And we see an improvement of two orders of magnitude with respect to this uh, uh, reference controller. <clears throat> 
So we can also do this as function of time, of course, uh, as function of velocity, and then see what the mean contrast is within the control radius. And then we see that for the integrator, we see that perfectly matches uh, what you would expect from frozen flow. Uh, the contrast degradation, uh, the predictor almost stays uh, close to the perfect uh, controller. And only at the end, at the very high speeds, we see a bit of degradation. Um, so then one important thing is non-stationarity of the atmosphere. How well can you track it? So here you can see at the top how the speed changes and the direction of the wind flow changes during the uh, simulations. So this first one was just me adding steps to the uh, wind speed. That's just to see how, how does the algorithm react to sudden changes in the wind speed. And as you can see that it's okay, it can manage it. There's still pretty good uh, performance uh, increase. But what you can also see is that the um, residuals are proportional to the wind speed. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see at the edges, we can see these overshoots and undershoots happening. And that's uh, the Gibbs phenomena in time. In time. Does a predictive controller, does a temporal deconvolution? Because it takes into account your uh, DM impulse response and the system behavior. So you sort of start to do a, a deconvolution. With deconvolution, you always get these Gibbs phenomena effects a little bit, this ringing. So then we can make the non-stationarity a little bit more extreme. So over five seconds, the wind speed changes by seven half meters per second from 17 and a half to 25. And the wind direction changes by more than 270 degrees. So that's almost full uh, circle. And then here you can see, uh, uh, oh yeah, again, you can see the residuals. So the predictor is still better, is still doing better than the integrator. And what's also interesting is that the, uh, that at the end, the predictor is doing better than it did in the beginning. But at the end, the wind speed is rough, is quite similar to the initial speed here. So you can see that even with this weird, uh, very noisy uh, wind direction and wind speed changes, it's learning. So this is really white noise that I added. So it's really a random normal walk. So there's no correlation at all uh, in what direction the wind is going to change. But what we see is that the improvement is only a factor five, which means that starlight rejection improvement is roughly factor 24 in this very non-stationary case. So non-stationarity really uh, impacts uh, the performance of predictive control for high contrast imaging. So we also validated the algorithm on MagiOX. So here you can see a schematic of MagiOX. So on the top, the most important thing to uh, note is that MagiOX is a woofer tweeter setup with an Alpower DM97 as a woofer and a Boston Mic Machine 2 KDM as a tweeter. And then the light goes down on the bench and then here's a, a pyramid waveform sensor. Um, because of how I've written the program a couple months ago when I did, this, did uh, these experiments, I could not, I could not uh, control the full tweeter yet because that was uh, too much for my Python code. So my, the first validation experiments were done with the Alpower 97DM at 200 hertz. So that those were the first, just see if the algorithm itself is really implemented, is working. So we are using the DM itself to control, uh, to create and control the turbulence. So here on the left, you can see an animation. I hope that everybody can see the animation. But on the top left, we have just the, what the PSF is doing when we're doing nothing, so the bench PSF. On the top right, we can see the turbulence. On the bottom left is the integrator, and on the bottom right is the data-driven predictive controller. So one thing to note here is that I use the unmodulated pyramid waveform sensor, uh, which, is, which shows here that, I mean, you look at this input PSF, that it's really non-linear, but even with the non-linearities included, we can still close the loop because we're only working with residuals at every time step. I don't care about the full uh, waveform. Um, and then to estimate a little bit what kind of contrast gain we had, we have with the algorithm, I used two measurements. I did take a measurement in one, uh, with the wind speed going into one direction and the data set with the wind speed going in an orthogonal direction. And then the difference between these two data sets shows the temporal stability 
or how well you are actually uh, stabilizing your PSF. So if you compare the two of them again, you see on the left for the integrator, we see two butterflies, which is expected because we're, uh, well, we see one butterfly because we're um, rotating the wind driven halo by 90 degrees and subtracting it. So this is exactly the pattern that you would expect. And for the predictor, we have uh, a lot less residuals. So you can see the scale bar that this is uh, a couple times 10 to the minus five uh, in contrast. So this injected companion that I put there in the data has a delta magnitude of 11 or three times 10 to the minus five at four lambda over D. Um, and this was, this was taken with 10 seconds of data. So in conclusion, we have this uh, derived and implemented a new distributed predictive controller for high contrast imaging. The simulations show two orders of magnitude improvement for frozen flow, but only one order of magnitude roughly for non-stationary turbulence. Uh, we have to try the algorithm in the lab and have been able to sex, uh, successfully close the loop. So the outlook is, is that current that we are trying to implement a high-speed version in the RTC of MediOX. So at the last week, so I don't have any results of that yet. I was able to close the loop on a thousand modes on the tweeter at uh, 600 hertz. And that's really the limit of my Python interface because Python cannot keep up with the uh, camera frame rate. But if, it's, if we go to a complete RTC implementation, we should be able to run at one and a half kilohertz. Uh, we need to figure out how much additional effects such as photo noise and boiling of the atmosphere, what, what they do to the predictability. And we need to investigate what the optimal hyperparameters of the controller are, such as how much of the future do you want to predict and how much of the past do you want to take into account? And also a couple of regularization parameters that are uh, in the controller. We need to see what's the optimal, um, uh, yeah, what, what's the optimal uh, values for those hyperparameters. So thank you. And I'll leave it here. If anybody has questions, you can ask now or send the questions on Slack. Okay, um, so actually, uh, thank you, thank you, Sebastian, for the talk. So you have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is from Pablo Robles saying, um, did you compare uh, your model not only with you know results of pure integrator, but with some methods like LQG, so predictive method? Do you have a comparison with you know similar methods? Um, no, I did not do that. Um, so. I have never be, I, I've never implemented an LQG algorithm before. Well, I mean, I've not done it now with this data-driven because this is effectively a model-free data-driven uh, LQG controller. Um, but I've not done a model-based one. Oh. Yet. It's on the it's on the. Uh, it's, I, I should put it in the Outlook. It's on, <laughs> it's something that I need to add. Okay, okay. And the last maybe quick question you want um, is from Jerome Pafik. I, I think it's an interesting one. So what, have you simulated multi-layer with different wind direction in simulation or in the bench? This is a question I have, me too. How do you simulate the temporal behavior you know, of the atmosphere in your simulation? Um, so I have not done, uh, not done that. And that's because I use this um, model control. Um, so because I control every mode independently of each other, there is no way of the modes to learn from each other uh, what the wind speed or what the wind speed is going to do. So you really need to have this spatial coupling to make to have, let the wind speed, um, let the, uh, have the system know about the wind speed because otherwise it will not, uh, it cannot learn from its neighbors what's going to happen. Yes, um, uncoordinated power spectral, temporal power spectral density for all your modes. Yeah, so the modes they just have a random power, yeah. random power spectrum, and they just go. So I've tried different power spectra, and it seems it didn't really matter what kind of power spectrum I put in. Okay. Uh, so Sebastian, thanks again. You have uh, a couple of more questions. You can look at the Slack channel, and um, thanks. We move to the next speaker.